It's all great as long as wh- you fucking broke my cord. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. So it just popped wow. right off. Yep. Well, I'm just going to leave that right there. What a dick. We, what a <laughs> dick. What, I don't know how that happened. Well. You know what? The the uh, the bottle probably said, you know, fuck you. You don't yeah, like me? Yeah. yeah. That's not going to give me I anymore. guess we're not going to try that one, right? <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> what a, like, seriously, God. though, what a dick. everyone welcome back i'm sure you missed those opening credits just as much as we did and this week on wednesday it was national bourbon day so what a better way to bring back the podcast than having it on the week of national bourbon day you know last week or should i say the past break uh we had a chance to really regroup and uh, refigure out our strategy and we didn't really get to relax too much we recorded i think close to 11 podcasts over this break so it's we got a lot of good ones in the hopper and still we're interviewing and talking to a lot of guests that are still to come. If you're not following us on all those great social media channels, then you may have missed it, but we have completely revamped and relaunched our website, bourbonpursuit.com. So when you go to the homepage, you can now sort all of our podcasts and all of our episodes by distillery, by whiskey women, bourbon roundtables. There's even a full text and index searchable uh, piece to it. So you can search any keyword and you can find any podcast that you might want to know about. This is, of course, another video podcast for today. And moving forward, these are all going to be uh, done on video. So make sure you like us on Facebook. You follow us on Facebook because that's where all the podcasts are going to be posted. So you go there and you'll be able to see all the new podcasts that are going to be coming out. It's a great way to be able to see all the interactions that are happening between us and the guests. And especially with Fred Minnick today, I think you're really going to enjoy it. And lastly, we are always looking for partnerships to help and grow and support this podcast. So say you work at a marketing agency or you work at a marketing company or work in a marketing group at a company, or maybe you just own a small business and you want to get in front of 10,000 whiskey geeks per episode, send us an email or what you can do is you can actually go to our website, bourbonpursuit.com, look at the very top tab and there's a partnerships link. Go there. We've got a media kit with all the information about our downloads, our stats and everything that we can do to get your brand in front of thousands of whiskey geeks. With that, enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to an episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast, the official podcast of bourbon. Uh, well, Ryan, we are here back at it again. We're in uh, Fred's bunker. Yeah, I know, and we're uh, we're doing uh, yet you know moving to video, which is fun. I think it brings a new a dynamic to to what people can get out of the podcast. Whether you're watching this, uh, I think it's it's fun because you can kind of see us what we're doing right now, what we're drinking, and all those kind of good things too. Yeah, we're hanging out in Fred's bunker. Uh, appreciate. You haven't us. We're stealing his uh, stash right now, but drinking on some Texas whiskey, which is a first for us. I know because definitely we've got, I don't want to say pride, maybe prejudice, maybe whatever it is, but it's, uh, we, we typically don't steer out of the state, but this is, it's actually, it's drinkable. It's, yeah. It's good. Um, and from what he's told me. I know me, a lot of people say, oh, that's got great potential. And you're like, <laughs> it's, oh, good. it's good. It's good for craft. It's good for craft, but it is actually I can see the potential. So I guess I'll introduce our guest, Fred Minnick. Everybody knows him. Everybody loves him. Uh, he's got I books. Don't go that far. Whis- yeah. Yeah, not everybody loves him, but you know he's got <laughs> a lot of books out there. You got Bourbon Curious, Rum Curious. Um, we've got Whiskey Women, um, Bourbon: The Rise, Fall, and History and Rebirth. There's so many, right? So uh, Fred, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. So I want you to just give us an idea of what we are drinking right here, because this is something that was uh, unique, bottle number four of 124 of a five-year spirit from Texas. Well, I just grabbed a bunch of random shit here, um, and um, I pulled on this one, and you, your eyes blew up. You're like, oh, Texas. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to get the hell out of here. You kidding me? And, um, Got you know, this, this, was, on the top of this it. is a Balcones, uh, the, the bourbon, um, you know, their, their fifth anniversary. I thought it was really good. I'm actually a big fan of some of the Texas bourbons coming out. Um, I like what uh, Garrison Brothers is doing and what Balcones is doing. Uh, There's also a brand called Iron Root that's doing some cool things. And uh, I got news for you guys. You know, you may be loyal to Kentucky and all that, and that's that's fantastic. I am I am too. But you want you want these other states to do well. Uh, for bourbon uh, as a category. Rising tide yeah. raises all boats, Because right? if, if bourbon is to take that next level, you know, these guys have to have to be there. 
And, that, and this is the direction of flavor that you want to see people going. Um, you don't want to see wood. You don't want to see burnt grains. And so when it comes to these smaller distilleries, you know, you're looking for like a, a, a taste of elimination. And when, when I taste like, um, like a plastic or a drywall or a burnt corn. It's like when you're tasting drywall, you just go <laughs> just put a hole in your wall and be like, there's a lot just... of construction going on. Right <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of construction. I also wrestled. So like, you know, I, 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 I face a few foes who maybe put my head through drywall. So I've actually got a, and I was in the military where uh, maybe I had some drywall flavorings there. But anyway, this isn't about my drywall tasting abilities. <laughs> um, but you, you, but what you're looking for in these in these uh, newer distilleries are good flavors versus bad. And there's, uh, I would say this is um, this is one of the better bourbons that have, have come out, out outside of um, Kentucky. And it, what's interesting is this actually has this was this was made by Chip Tate, and Chip Tate, of course, you know had. The name sounds familiar to me. Yeah, he was the founder for for Balcones, and he was uh, he had a, a dispute with the people that came in uh, for partnership, uh, and so this would have been one of his last releases. So this is uh, uh, it's, it's to me it's one of the it's one of the examples of where you can go. Uh, this is a this is from my Dusty collection. It's a uh, Four Roses um, single barrel for the Japanese market. Um, if you read my blog, fredminnick.com, you may have, may recall this bottle. I scored it. Uh, it's an example of how like old dusties are not always good. Right. You know, so, uh, this is, it, it's okay, but I, I saw would, you just dump it. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> he I would, did. He, he poured himself a good hefty, probably one and a half ounce pour in his Glen Cairn and just took a sip and he said, well, this is going in the trash. Yeah. Well, so can we sub out a bottle? <laughs> I, my, my point with, with the tasting this is like, I would take modern four roses any day of the week mm-hmm. and, and, um, what, what they do at four roses, is exceptional stuff. And, and, you know, they had some quality issues back in the, in the early nineties and late eighties. And, you know, when they, what they were sending to Japan wasn't, uh, wouldn't always meet that same standard that they have today. So I think I think the Four Roses you get today is leaps and bounds better than would have been exported to it's Japan. It's good to know. It's good to know. So I guess uh, let's go. Let's talk about what you've been doing like in the past sure. few months, right? The last and time you were on was Barrel that? Batch 11, the one in San Francisco. Yeah, we, we want to talk about San Francisco for sure. So I want to talk about you know, the last episode you were on was episode 69. Um and since then, uh, what have you been up to? Like uh, that was that was about six months ago, a year ago, something. That was about six months ago. But yeah, like kind of kind of what's been going on? Uh, I've been writing books and uh, uh, writing for magazines, um, and basically just doing a lot more events. Like I've been right around the time that we we had our last conversation, people were starting to come to me just to do private tastings and. Um, do all this just one-on-one stuff and if you'd have told me when i was in high school that i'd be <laughs> drinking for a living and writing about people it, be paying you to come i mean it, i've just conduct shot. a bourbon tasting and, and i've always done things with the kentucky derby museum i've had a, a good five-year relationship with those guys that's been awesome which you can also get on Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. Right. We yep. are partner with the Legend Series with Fred Minnick being the MC there. So it's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited to have you all there. It's good to have those recordings. I think you should actually ask to get the old ones because they've, record all of, they've recorded all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, we have some great, great, great interviews there from years past. But I wish we would have thought about it earlier, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. So. Well, we tried once and failed miserably. <laughs> <laughs> but now I, I hope you enjoy it, though. I feel like I tried to bring like a... a Absolutely. Um, a geek level kind of enthusiasm oh, there. I can definitely see you getting excited there. You get to put like your journalist hat on and ask hard questions. and Because they're on stage. They can't Yeah, do, they, they can't, can't run. back out. They and you can kind of see some of the questions you ask, they're kind of like, you know, squirming in their chair yeah. a little bit. They're like, <laughs> oh, I guess I got to answer this. But, you know, the one I asked, you know, Campbell Brown, when I asked him about uh, Marianne. Oh, yeah. Marianne he, Barnes. You uh, could tell it was a little awkward. I, well, but I thought that he answered that so well. Like I mean, he complimented her, and he he, you know, uh, he he nailed it. I thought, but uh, at the same time, I'm try. It's it's what I try to do. I try to bring like a journalistic style things, but and that has that has brought in people to want me to do private tastings with them. You know, more at home and more uh, at like uh, major you know corporation events. So um, one of the coolest things I've done is I had the Asian ambassador delegation. Uh, and I did a private tasting with them. I've done like um, 
I did a private tasting for um, Wayne LaPierre and the executive, the the high level NRA members, which you know everyone has an opinion on that. I'm not going there for that, <laughs> but just to say that that's that's kind of stuff. I'm I'm getting the opportunity to do, uh, and I've got a lot of cool things that it's coming up. One of the things is that everyone in Louisville knows about Forecastle. I'm getting to uh, kind of host and lead the fireside chats for that. And Forecastle is this amazing, you know, concert series that was homegrown here. You guys had J.K. McKnight on. Yeah, he was on ago. a few episodes yep. ago. And he, he actually mentioned me being a part of it. And so he kind of teased it there. But I'm, I'm leading their fireside chat. So I get to take a little bit of what I do at the Kentucky Derby Museum and do it there in the, in the Bourbon Lodge at Forecastle. Uh, another thing I'm doing is Bourbon and Beyond. Uh, the Danny Wimber Presents groups uh, called me up and said, hey, we're doing this thing with uh, Stevie Nicks and Steve Miller Band and Eddie Vedder, and we would like you to I'm curate, excited. curate yeah, our yeah, bourbon that's side a, that's a That's a, that's a I'm big, more, something that hard to say no to, right? I'm more like, excited about Tom Colicchio. Yes. Top yeah, chef. I, I'm a Top Chef guy. So. Yeah. We, we've, I'm, uh, we've, you know, part of that programming there, and it's, it's amazing. We're doing like a lot of food pairings. We're going to be doing a lot of... Uh, uh, really cool educational seminars, and I think to me it's like it. It's kind of fun to see uh, the combination of music and um, and bourbon go together. It's always been pretty much together, music and bourbon. It, it's been together, but <laughs> please, if it's like it, like it's, a good, might as well cool make it official. Six, Sixty-eight degrees, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, in the middle of June and at uh, ninety degrees, that's gonna be it's gonna be tough to put your game face on. I think. Yeah. Well. We'll have you know it'll be cool in our, some of the areas and then yeah, shaded VIP, over yeah. VIP AC yeah tent of course and I just think it's really cool that here we are now you know, I remember ten years ago you know a bourbon event was basically just going to liquor barn and <laughs> yeah. you know talking to Jim Rutledge or Jimmy Russell and tasting and now you have uh, some of the the most valued and important concert organizers in the world. Um, you know, bringing bourbon in, and it's uh, it's it's really cool to see how far uh, how far that's come, and to be able to be a part of it. It's like I'm pinching myself every day. Every day, I'm thankful for for these opportunities. I mean, uh, you got you got ahead of it uh, very early on. You know, in your very well known name that's inside of just the bourbon industry in general, right? So I think you were probably their number one choice for a lot of these things because not. They, you know, they're going to be wrong. There's a lot of people that know a lot of stuff about whiskey, but not everybody is a very good presenter. They're not able to get up on stage or maybe ask the hard questions to the right people or whatever it is, too, right? And you're able to do all those. Well, it's kind of you, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I look at it as like um, it's all right time, right place kind of thing. And and I think I've I've learned a lot from the people I've interviewed over the years. Some of the most entertaining people have been like Fred No. Who can spin a yarn? Uh, you know, um, yeah. and I you think just ask questions. You just sit back and take it all in. Yeah, you, just, you <laughs> don't know where things are going to go. You let it ride. We could do it. We could do like a cuss word counter, like they did yeah. on South Park one time <laughs> yeah. too, right? Yeah. But I look at this as uh, uh, as entertainment. You know, while I'm able to do a little bit of kind of, yeah, um, you know, I, I don't do much investigative work anymore because it's just not. It's a rat race. <laughs> well, it, it, the type of stuff I was doing, no one it's was reading. It's already been brought out. Well, it's brought out, no one was reading it. You know, that, that's a big thing is you can see what people read now. You know, I can see, I mean, I, I did some uh, exposés. I might have had like 300 people read it, you know, versus I was like, man, I spent, I spent like 400 hours on this. Um, you know, so I think like, you know, we can be serious in this business, but to an extent, this is this is a this is an entertainment business because it's basically the same as like sports, um, to some degree, you know, movies and all that. But what people are interested in is mostly is how things taste. So anytime I write about something, what my my thoughts on a on a particular bourbon, shit goes through the roof. Yeah. You know, uh, where if it's a if it's a if it's a lawsuit, you know, I might have, you know one-tenth of the readers so it, it's a lot of it and, and believe me i don't get paid to write things on my blog i have whiskey advocate and whiskey magazine pay me but you know they're not in it they want how the whiskey's made and how um and what what it tastes like and all that so it's a it's a very interesting world in terms of how i've evolved in terms of how i used to cover this world 
Um, and, he, and in my books, that's just pure me. That's what I want to write, and I don't give a shit if anybody buys them. That's what I'm writing, you know? Mm-hmm. So Bourbon Curious is, in Bourbon, uh, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of an American Whiskey. Those, those are exactly the words I want to put down, and, and uh, fortunately, people have bought those. And I think those, the legends and the more juicy details are better fit for, for a book, uh, in which case I'll always be putting them in there. But uh, another cool thing I'm doing... And this one probably um, probably blew my mind over everything else, and that was a, a, a bourbon cruise. Um, oh, that's with Nor- Norwegian that's, Norwegian like, cruise lines uh, via a um, an agency planning service reached out to me, and we're doing a a really cool cruise in uh, February, February tenth through eighteenth, where we're going to uh, start in Miami and. You know, go down, go through the Caribbean. Wow! And we'll have like bourbon they, classes. The official, can we get media passes? As I say, the official podcast of the Bourbon that, Cruise, right? You know. Yeah, we'll look into that for you. <laughs> yeah, you guys mind? Uh, you know, being in like the <laughs> the, the, the very gallows, the very bottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you put coal in the, the engine <laughs> for the engine that sure they're running? Well, that's a, that's a pretty interesting. I guess talk, talk me about so Norwegian clu- cruise lines, Bourbon Cruise. But I mean, like, what could you expect if you were to go on something like that? So there's going to basically. I'm just like a little bit of entertainment for you. Like you're going, we're going to do. Um, are you going to be in a in a speedo, or you know, <laughs> swimming? He's, he's going to be. Uh, uh, Nobody jugg- wants juggling. to see me in the speedo. <laughs> juggling fire, definitely not I'm juggling. Gonna... But um, basically, you know, it's going to be doing some tastings, uh, some seminars. Um, uh, we're working on having some distillers there. Um, in fact, when this airs, we might actually have somebody who is um, who will be there with us to do like a like a basically a Derby Museum style Q&A. And um, it's gonna, there are going to be a lot of classes, but really it's about being on the ocean. You know, you get really nice, sweet. Uh, you get, uh, we're going to be uh, porting in, in the Bahamas, um, St. Thomas. So you're going to have a lot of uh, you know, just typical cruise stuff. All the food and uh, drink come with, you know, your your purchase. That's that's the best deal right there. Can I and by the way, we're not we're not drinking swill. So uh, and I also good whiskey for eight days. Yeah, we're gonna have. On. It's basically just imagine and all the like, German men you need yeah. to get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bunch of bourbon and a bunch of rum. Uh, well, bur- bourbon is the headliner here, but there will still be some rum. I feel like I don't. I feel like you cannot go on uh, go on a cruise without having some rum. I, I would think it it seem it seemed fitting, and yeah, you're kind of the guy to talk about it too, line. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's as you know, I wrote a rum book, mm-hmm. uh, Rum Curious, and I've been been very hot on rum for for some time, and uh, I I think they complement one another on and this cruise is a is a great case in point. You know, uh, the Jefferson's Ocean is an interesting is an interesting study, you know, in terms of like that style of rum, but they actually did used to ship barrels of bourbon to europe and they would extract some of that kind of like ocean flavors from uh from the sea there is there is one um that i saw recently called like penny packer bourbon right it's mm-hmm. actually distilled here yet it's bottled in germany right so it, it just kind of has a jefferson's ocean maybe <laughs> twang or taste to it but doesn't really package or market itself like that yeah penny packer it's a that that's an older kind of uh, brand. I haven't spent a lot of time with it, but the people would uh, prior to prohibition, there was a uh, Alsley Brown shipped. Uh, I want to say like twenty thousand gallons of, of bourbon to uh, France, and they would they would sell a lot of they would sell in bulk to these countries. And Germany bought a lot. Japan bought a lot. France bought a lot for blending purposes. Um, so you had all these countries who were who were buying American whiskey, and it, it's true you would get different flavors uh, over there. So um, the origins of of, of Jefferson's uh, Ocean uh, is in truth there is. I mean, it was not a very large market, but it, it happened. All right, because when I when I read that label, I was always kind of amazed that it would be cheaper to ship the barrels to Germany to have it bottled, and then ship it back here to actually sell it in the store. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, Still blows my mind today, but I mean that's that's a good tidbit information. So uh, another question I kind of ask you about, you know, the the laws are changing here in Kentucky, and you brought out this Four Roses uh, dusty bottle, and there is kind of a, a new dusty law that's been talked about, mm-hmm. and this is allowing regular consumers that have been uh, 
hoarding bottles or uh, <laughs> being like Ryan and asking family members to start digging through yeah. their, their old liquor cabinets. But it gives you the ability to actually sell to uh, bars, restaurants, and retail stores. Um, what are your thoughts? Like, what? Because I think I think it's a I think it's for my opinion. I think it's a really cool thing and it's a good thing because we are the home of the Bourbon Trail. And if you want to try any bourbon that's ever been made and kind of run the gamut, you should be able to do it here. Not right? go to DC. Exactly. And I think there's a, there's a lot of cool things that it's going to do in regards of tourism for the restaurants and bars. But I kind of want to get your opinion. Yeah, I, I think that the vintage uh, the vintage spirits bill, as it was kind of dubbed, was probably the most important. Uh, uh, consumer law passed in Kentucky since the end of Prohibition. And all the laws that have been passed in the state have either been like, you know, to raise taxes or to benefit distillers in one way, one way shape, or form. But there's really not been anything that specifically benefited consumers. And the distillers, they don't get, unless they're opening a bar, which a lot of them are, mm-hmm. uh, they don't get anything out of this. All they get is maybe that, you know, people come down here and, and, and go, you know, for a, a tourist destination. So is that packed into this bill where they can now serve cocktails or whatever? It's well, that was store? that was in previous bills. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. so they had... 11, the, percent of Bill 11 or something yeah, there, like that. Yeah, there, there were previous bills that allowed them to have bars and, and, and a, a cocktail scene and restaurants. And so you have a lot of them doing that. Um, basically, their their whole vision is to be like like California, you know, where you have... Where you have um, Napa Valley, you know, owning owning the day with restaurants and what have you. Mm-hmm. But I, I believe that you know, and I've been I've been interviewed by a lot of people about this. Um, um, I feel like it's about time. In uh, in wine, nobody bats an eye if you buy a bottle from ni- from the nineteen sixties from another person or in an auction. Yet in whiskey, you're you're looked at as like a Flipper. Yeah, criminal. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, well, the flipper, that's a whole different that's category. A different thing. But, I mean, here we are relegated to uh, purchase uh, wherever we can these old bottles. And you can you can look around in my office to see that I maybe go out a time or two to buy a, a bottle here and there and, you know, exchange. Um, put some money back in the economy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I... I, I we can carry it back in my trunk, you know. Yeah, I do that. You give out free memberships to fredmanic dot com. That's free anyway. But yeah. I don't think it's valuable, but uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, y- anyway, you have a uh, you you have all this enthusiasm, um, but yet we're not able to in- uh, reap the same you know benefits as you know wine enthusiasts. So I think it's about time, and I think it's a great law that passed, uh, and I'm very excited, and and you know I'm. I I buy a lot of it. Why now? What do you think the catalyst is was like finally we can do this? What what I think these I think these bourbon distillers are extremely smart and they saw that there's a ceiling. Uh the ceiling is fast approaching for for tourism. And the state saw that too. You know, the state wants people to come here. And um right now, if you want to buy if you want a bottle of something from uh the 1960 Stitzel Weller, when uh, the Van Winkles owned it, good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. Your chances are not very good uh, that you're going to be able to, you know, acquire a bottle or taste a bottle. But now it will be uh, more accessible for people to come and taste it. So when you reach that, when you reach that level where you've, as let's say, you're a, a Wall Streeter, you've reached that level where you've tasted everything in bourbon. And you're like, okay, you got your favorites, and you've got your your next thing, but what's still, next? Like, what's what else next? is there? What right? else is there? And so now you know that you can fly to Kentucky and experience the uh, like a bottle of a uh, you know 1964 uh, Old Fitzgerald. You know, that's the year that bourbon got its unique uh, product designation from Congress. Um, it's a year that uh, uh, Pappy. The Van Winkles still would have owned the family, or still would have owned the distillery, and so like you know you want to taste that. That's a little bit of piece of history. So you can't do that right now. Uh, you could go to you could go to Jack Rose, you can go to Cannon in Seattle, but it's not Kentucky, mm-hmm. and so people are wanting to experience that. And oh by the way, there are people who are commissioning private jets to do stuff like that. I mean I've been hired to do private tastings with some of these people, and. It, 
if if Kentucky's not there to answer that call, then suddenly will. suddenly yeah. they're going to France for Armagnac. And so it's very it's very much um, in Kentucky's best interests interests to have uh, to have that next step for for that high level connoisseur. And oh by the way, you know a lot of people are not always going to like what they get in the <laughs> in the vintage markets. It's completely different flavor profiles. Sometimes the bottle's sour. You know, there's a there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to talk about something else, right? Because you've also been busy. You uh, you took a trip out west coast to San Francisco, mm-hmm. and that was uh, that was an interesting because you one of your highlights of the blogs, and I think uh, well, I mean, it definitely lit up the whiskey world because the next day the shelves were cleaned yet again <laughs> in Kentucky. But um, I, I want to kind of talk about it because you you called it one of the greatest upsets of uh, a whiskey competition. So, yeah. so kind of talk about it a little bit because we are drinking it right now as well. Yeah. So, um, Ryan, would you mind? I, no. For those uh, listening, I like, I, I bruised a, a rib and literally pouring. No, I just think you like to be served. <laughs> <laughs> pouring a bottle actually hurts really bad. So if I can get Until Ryan to do it, pour, yeah. Yeah, then he'll feel better. I'll be numb after this yeah. one. Uh, so I am a judge. Um, on the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Um, and uh, from a numbers perspective, they get the most bottles of, of the competitions out there. And I've been I've been a judge on that for a few years now. And is every that like year, your Super Bowl? Uh, yeah, it's like, it, it is like, it's a Super Bowl. It, it really is. It, it's a Super Bowl, and it's also like a fraternity because it's the world's greatest palates. And, you know, consumers don't get to... A lot of uh, a lot of the spirits industry um, is basically behind closed doors, and you don't see the people. Like you know about me, and you know about David Wondrich, and you know about a lot of other people who are very public, like uh, you know Greg Davis from Maker's Mark, or or Jim Rutledge, formerly with Four Roses. You know about those people, but the most important people in the spirits business are distributors, and distributors basically taste things and decide where. Where they go, and that's that's a good chunk of the judges there, as well as what I think are probably you know right there with them, and that's the bar owners and the liquor store owners. You know, these are people who have respected palates and are highly appreciated. And then there's like me and like some some <laughs> some tasters of um, you know some people who who write about the stuff and just you know know the categories and uh, have proven their their worth in this in this world. And um, so, in my opinion, best palettes in the world are, are in that room, uh, with the exception of a you know, few are missing, obviously, because not everyone's a, a member or a part of that. And so, what we do is we we taste. Uh, it starts at the panel level, and the panel will get several categories, and we will all taste them and we will medal them. And we are asked to medal medal them based on the glass. Um, and I like to equate it to being like a, a magazine scoring system. So a 70 to like 79 would be a bronze. Okay. And so an 80 to 89 would be a silver and then 90 and above would be a gold. Now there's not very many bourbons or spirits that you will taste that fall below that kind of like 70 point level. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I score a lot of things below seventy points for, really? whi- for whiskey advocate. Yeah, you can go through my my history of of, uh, of what I've rated, and I've scored a lot mm-hmm. of things sixty to sixty nine. And so, but there's not, you know, even some of the ones that I wasn't too hot on, I would score it a seventy four. And I don't think there's a lot of people who'd be very excited to have a seventy four from me. But uh, so those those are the those are kind of the standards we're given. We're judged by the glass, and we're you know, I try to follow that kind of like magazine standard. If at your table every single judge gives something a gold, then you all um, then that then that glass is then given a double gold, and right then and there we decide whether or not it can go forward as a uh, if it should go forward to compete for best in um, best in class. And so, like a class would be like in this in this competition. They separate straight bourbon from small batch and single barrel. Um, every competition is different, but this is how they do it. And so, so we, I had naturally, I get, I draw the bourbon. So whatever panel I'm on gets, uh, gets a good chunk of the bourbons. And 
we had uh, we had a bourbon flight, um, and I remember tasting this one. I was like loaded with marzipan, honey, really rich. It just stood out, and and everything's it, blind too, right? Er- everything's blind. We will know the proof, uh, so we will know. We'll be told the proof, and if there's a stated age, we will be given the age. Um, and I, I was like. Um, this is this is spectacular, and everyone agreed. It was like everyone's like highest. Uh, it it was uh, probably the most appreciated for my panel that we had had, and so we sent it on. And then other people had bourbons too, and they would send theirs on. And there was what we have called a super taste off. And at the super <laughs> taste off is when you have all of these. It's like there's a joke hidden in there yeah. somewhere, right? <laughs> So you have a you have a super taste off, and then you have um, you have all these other um, you know people who people gravitate toward what they know. So you have like you know the the spirits buyer for a major a major um, bar in L.A. You have uh, you know the leading whiskey bartender in the country. You have uh, you know people like that. Um, one guy's on the Bourbon Hall of Fame, you know, is in there. Uh, so you have a lot of these like really high level tasters will go to the super taste off to to taste uh, what's what there's really really strong in. Like I wouldn't be going to the super taste off for gin. I can judge gin, but that's going to be reserved for people who are really strong in gin. Yeah, I'm obviously really strong in bourbon and rum, so those are the ones in rye and other whiskeys. So those are the ones I would get picked for. And so I go over there. And uh, and we're tasting. We have, I think there's probably twelve bourbons we have to narrow down to the finals. And at this point, we don't know anything about them. They don't tell us uh, uh, this year with country of origin. <laughs> yeah. Well, with bourbon, you obviously know. I'm just it's yeah. like a spelling bee thing, right? Yeah. Like how? Could yeah. You, so we like, how could you how could you decipher this much? As so possible? now we're just now we're just tasting and we're raising our hand when we're asked to to vote on it. Uh, and I tasted uh, what I thought was this one. Again, it's blind. And although I've been doing this for a while, you're sometimes tricked with what you're tasting. Like you're like, oh, I think it's this, but it's really that. Especially after a long day of tasting. And so we 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 put forth what we thought were the best, and they would compete for the next day for for best in category. So we had just you know we determined class, and then we determined category. So class being straight, small batch, str- uh, single barrel, so forth. With the, those the best of those classes would then go on to compete for for best bourbon and we would taste these and as i would later find out it would be barrel uh barrel bourbon batch 11 um competing against um an elijah craig um and a um a blanton's um i thought the blanton's what i would later turn out would later learn would be a uh, blanton's uh, barrel proof straight from the barrel yeah yeah I export thought, only i thought it was really solid it was really rich and just Kind of like a real traditional one, real traditional bourbon or a caramel bomb, if you will. I was actually honestly surprised that uh, an export only like yeah, was in there, right? Up. Something that's just not even available ju- in the states. I am just judge. Yeah. I, what, what gets sent there, I have, I have no, I have, I have no say in that. So mm-hmm. like, I can only judge what's in my glass and, and you know that that competition. Well, and too, uh, like with single barrels, it's like how you're tasting how you know? that. That's the only barrel of that, you know. So it's yeah. like. How can that be fair? I, I think know, that's a know? great critique. Um, I really do. Um, and if you you know you feel so strongly, set it to the the competition. But <laughs> but I'm I'm just Your a judge comments. on the yeah. So like I I, I look at those um, and and I think they're that warrants some uh, some thought. But you know what I have learned is that some people will send things to competition and uh, find you know see if they want to enter to market. So who's to say that it's not coming to the U.S.? I mm-hmm. don't know. It's probably not. I'm probably just you know throwing out another rumor here. <laughs> but, conspiracy, conspiracy but, theory. But like, I mean, this. What I've learned in the spirits business is that you know when it comes to when it comes to intent and what is, it can be any number of things, and then you throw in money and. Everything kind of just gets goes, a little mixed up. Every, it's it's a different world. This isn't this isn't the choir boy industry, but I feel like San Francisco with the judges and how we do it. I'm very proud of like being a part of it because I feel like we're very fair to every glass there. 
if that makes sense. Absolutely. And that's our that's our objective, or at least the objective that we're that's laid upon us is to be fair to the glass before you. And so I guess talk about this barrel bourbon batch eleven. Like what what was it that automatically like stood out or and, and I guess I also want to know your your like was it shock when you found out? Like what was your what was your initial reaction? Well, what I'm looking or what for. What did you think it was when, oh. you, when you were drinking? <laughs> I want to know that. Uh, okay, yeah. So when when I'm tasting, I'm looking for uh, really pronounced notes, making sure like all the major things are there. Um, there's no flaws, and I'm wanting to make sure there's like not one note overtaking the other. And then when we get to this round, I mean, they're all kind of like really strong, right? So you're looking for one note that stands out above the other. Um, and is that one note stronger than what the other glass has? And I'm looking, I'm tasting these, I'm going back and forth. And what I would later learn was Blanton's was like a caramel bomb. It was really very classic in, in bourbon style. And it was, um, it was phenomenal. And then when I get to uh, the other glass, which I would later learn was Barrel, I thought to myself, this is so damn good. And there's not a, another taste in this competition like it. It's like this marzipan and honey and like this uh, intense, like, uh, you know, fried dough. Just had a lot of stuff going on with it. And each one of those notes was equal in how pronounced they were. So that would be what I would describe as nuance. And you know a complexity, if you will. Whereas, and then I would go back and taste the the other bourbon, and it was really, really forward with the caramel. Yeah, just one strong note. One many. very, yeah, very strong one. And then everything else was kind of like an undernote, or or like a hint. Was is how I would often write about it. It was like it'd be like a hint of of a baking spice or vanilla or or, or whatever. And so when you have when you have a um, um, a spirit that is one predominant note, and that note is amazing, and then most times that's going to win um, compared to a note uh, or compared to a bourbon that had like three or four notes that were just, they were on par with intensity as that one note, but there were three of them in that glass, three or four of them in that glass. That, to me, kind of creates a, a clear-cut winner. But it was these notes were so out there um, that I didn't, when I was voting for it, I did not think it would win because the other one was more of a traditional, you know, uh, flavor. And, you know, one of the things that I had thought about going into competition, that some of the best bourbon that I had tasted in the past year on a very consistent basis was sourced whiskey. And barrel bourbon being one of the, you know, premier leaders in that. And um, you... I don't know. Um, I, I don't know how they're getting their whiskey. I don't know. Obviously, I, I think it, we can all say for certain that Barrel's getting the stuff that they say is distilled in Tennessee from Dickel. But all the other ones, I don't always know where they're getting their stuff. But their stuff has been really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's been, it's solid. I mean, it's a good bourbon. Yeah, right. It's very good. And so when I when when this won, I was surprised. I was really, really surprised. But I had I had about four, three or four products that I thought was this was, uh, and Barrel was one of those um, three products that I thought it might be. Oh, okay, so you kind of had an idea, like I had an idea based on flavor profile, but I could not have skewed anybody. And believe me, um, but you knew it was going to be like a source whiskey. I, I had, had a, an idea. I had a feeling it was a source product. Mm-hmm. I did. I absolutely did. So when you were drinking the Blanton's, did you were like, this tastes like that typical? It tastes exactly trait. like Blanton's straight from the barrel. Right? Yeah. No. No. Okay. No. I had, I had no idea what that was. Interesting. What is marzipan? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you talk I'm like you do I'm talk like, about uh, it a lot, and I'm like, is it like a like a like a creme brulee, like a like a frosted sugar or something like that, or caramelized sugar? Like, I have no idea. You have your Google. <laughs> I have actually it all turned off right now. So yeah, yeah. And so it's basic. It's basically like an almond paste. Okay. Okay. It's real. It's a it's a special thing that you know, it's very commonly used in France. Gotcha. So, uh, you know, you taste a lot of whiskeys. I think it's like what you said, like 250 over the span of like 
72 hours or something like that. Last time we had talked about it, it's a, yeah. it's a lot. Now, because it always seems like in a marketing game, there's never anything that comes out and it says like, oh, we got a gold medal or a silver medal at San Francisco. Like, thumbs up to us, right? Because it seems like that's always like a, an easy shoe in for any kind of marketing uh, spiel, right? Yeah. Now, is is the how how high? Or should I say how high is that bar set to be able to to make it to that if level? If you get if you get gold, it's a to me it's a big deal. Uh, but again, it's I kind of equate it to like being a magazine score, you know. And not only that is once you make it one time, I'm pretty sure like even Eagle Rare has it on their little hang tag that says like we were gold medal in like the 2000 and well I think they're, the, they're required to have the year on there okay, yeah, okay. so they'll have that uh, but in that defense like you will see you will see uh, brands putting uh, medals on there from the 1800s <laughs> so uh, like uh, the glory days uh, Grand, Grand Marnier <laughs> will have uh, an 1800s medal on there I think there's even a Willet product that has. Uh, has a state fair medal on there. I want to say it's old Barstown. That's like Indiana thing in the relevant basketball when their last like championship was in the seventies. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So the, that's actually not too uncommon. You know, the thing about competitions um, is that the, there there are a lot of them. Um, there are a lot of them, but you know, in the in the early days of whiskey, you know, you didn't really have a you didn't have a trust in what what you were drinking, and so there was a government. There were government agencies that were created at the state level. They were called uh, assayers. I'm about knocked over my whole shelf. There. <laughs> Holy Bunch crap! Of Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For anybody that wasn't, or if you're not watching it, I'm sitting here trying to adjust audio, and then I put my shoulder back, and then it almost took down a, like Fred seven, freaked out for a second. Two hundred like, 200 <laughs> bottles worth of rum over here. Four fifty, but you know, hey, who's counting? <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, so. Um, yeah, so there were these assayers, uh, distillers would send in their product to these state, uh, these state uh, officials, and they would verify the quality of the whiskey, and would, in some cases would rate it, and the the distillers would then publish those um, those findings. Um, in the U.S. meat industry, we have USDA Select, USDA Choice, and USDA Prime. The the uh, packagers or the in the packing houses they actually pay for that. So they're not. That's not a, an inspector service. That's a marketing service. And spirits, we don't have anything like that. All we have are designations of age, and that's why you know the market kind of reacted to magazines in these competitions to give like a a quality stamp from somebody. And so there's not a. Uh, that's what consumers are looking for. They're looking for a quality stamp. And whether it be like you think it's a it's a uh, a magazine or it's a competition, if if it's a competition, what competition is it? But you can you can judge how valuable something is based on what the marketers will do with it. And if a if a brand only thing they have to show for is a bronze, they don't have other things to show for it. Then you know, as a consumer, that might be an indicator that it's not that uh, up to snuff because every bottle has that. So you have like a, you know, if you look at most of your shelves on most of the marketing materials, most of the bottles have some kind of metal. There's tons of competitions, and I'm, I'm a judge on a few of them. And, uh, yes, I do get paid. It's a uh, – it's fun. Yeah, about to say, <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for it. There's yeah. worse things. It, it, it's a lot of fun. It's better than shoveling elephant shit at the circus, right? Mm-hmm. So, Who the hell's shoveled elephant <laughs> shit in the circus in this room? No, not I. <laughs> I have shoveled pig shit. It, it, I did do that yeah. uh, growing up with hogs and such. But uh, at any rate, <laughs> Needless uh, to say. <laughs> I think when it comes to San Francisco, um, you can definitely trust that what we tasted that day, if it got gold or double gold or won something you can trust that what we tasted that day is exactly what we thought was the best Mm -hmm. and whether whether the brands take that and do something with it else elsewhere that's on them man that's on them i can't i can't do anything about that but i'm telling you what i tasted that day with with barrel bourbon what i later learned would be whistle pig uh for best whiskey i mean they were they Mars the pan loaded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of want to I want to take a twist on this a little bit, and um, you know, talk about just the the bourbon I don't know genre in 
in essence of what it is right now. I mean, do you think that bourbon is almost like, at least on the retail side and the marketing side, it's almost turning like a gimmick with releases now? Because um, at what point can we just stop it with all the experimentation? Because at some point, I, I thought Buffalo Trace has done everything across the moon of yeah. what could possibly be done. Well, I actually, I, I wrote about this uh, uh, for my column in Whiskey Advocate um, a year or two ago. And it's all great as long as... You fucking broke my cork. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. So it just popped wow. right off. Yep. Well, I'm just going to leave that right there. What a dick. We, what a dick. <laughs> what, I don't know how that happened. Well... You know what the it's, the uh, the bottle probably said. You know, fuck you. You don't yeah, like me. Yeah, yeah. That's not gonna one, give me I anymore. guess we're not gonna try that one, right? <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> what a, like seriously God. though? What a dick. Well, okay. I guess it's a good question. Even on dusty bottles, like I'm just sitting here, like trying to just barely nudge it out. Is there is there a a, a twist technique that I should have been doing properly? <laughs> You need, I didn't you, break your you cord. need to know how to twist something that's that never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway, uh the uh yeah, corks they they will dry out. You got to you got to you got to keep your cork wet. Mm -hmm. You got to go in there and rotate the bottle sometimes. Cork which you didn't do. Yeah. So Kenny broke it. Well, now, please don't break my balcony's bottle <laughs> you now. Some, you got some homework <laughs> now. Okay. <laughs> um um so where were we? What were we talking about? So we're just talking about just gimmicks oh, and release, bourbon, right? Yeah. Releases and you know, um, yeah. there's 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 no shortage of everything. I mean, let's let's take for example, um, Ryan, the talk real quick. Let me get a. Yeah. I'm gonna get you another bottle of something. Oh, you, no, you, you you guys talk about we'll, something, we'll then talking. I'll come in. And, uh, and and the one of the things that I'm kind of thinking about here is that we have things like the the orphan barrel release, uh, the orphan barrel release that just released in this beautiful wooden case that's probably worth uh i don't know i think it retails like 1800 or 2000 for like six bottles of orphan barrel plus the thing then you've got the latest uh old rip van winkle 25 that's got this charred wooden uh, comes with the original barrel in the yeah box. out of the box like i mean it's it's almost like people are wanting to collect uh display pieces and there's another thing that um it was very funny and, and interesting i saw this on one of those facebook things that there's a new abraham bowman release that's coming out it's a 375 milliliter rare release where they aged the bourbon nine years. Then they transferred into barrels that held bourbon that had been already aged for nine years. They lowered the proof before barreling it again and lowered the proof yet again when bottling three years later, uh, which it probably is not accurate to say that this is a 12-year-old whiskey. Um, but now it's also being taken down to 100, 100 proof, uh, being the equivalent like an $80 bottle. And they're coming out with a second version of this, and it's almost the same exact story where, again, it's a nine-year aged bourbon, but this time put into barrels that have already <laughs> been used three times, uh, once nine years in bourbon, sometimes in months for port, third times in months for bourbon, and now a fourth time. It's like it's the experimentation is almost going like through the roof where it's getting comical, and they're charging you know, 80 bucks, 100 bucks a bottle for a 375 Yeah, I think... Uh I turned it off. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think people are looking for relevancy. Um, and one of the, you know, Buffalo Trace obviously does not need relevancy. Uh, what they're trying to do, I believe, is different than a lot of other people. And let me let me give you some history of experimentation in whiskey. Like, let me ask you this. Um, do you know... Do you know um, the difference between barrel entry proofs in terms of how it impacts, you know, the whiskey flavor? Well, I mean, if it comes in at a lower proof, it should be able to take more characteristics of oak to be able to be. But most of that's more. anecdotal. You know, most of most of that's anecdotal. There have been a handful of studies, uh, and they were all pre nineteen sixties by Seagram's, uh, and there were a couple by you know Shinley. So most of most of the research on on what people are doing are based on you know, pre-1970, pre-1960. So when bourbon lost its lost its uh, glory in some ways in the late 70s and 80s, they just kind of did things to make money. Now that they have a little bit of that ability to experiment, they're back at it. And they're trying to answer questions that there's not a lot of good data points on. And, you know... What Buffalo Trace is doing with all their experimentation, you have to look at this as um, 
as an opportunity of like what the future could hold. A lot of it's going to taste like ass. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> There's not a lot of it's going to taste good. Um, and some of it is going to be brilliant. And I got guarantee you, you're already seeing it. But they, they want to call it rare too, right? They want to call it rare. And well, that's a, that's a different thing. Uh, in terms of the marketing and what they put on the label and how they're put, you know, coining in press releases, that I view those things completely separate. I'm, I'm looking at it, you know, from a pure science, science standpoint, I, I look at it differently than the marketing side. Like on the production houses and what they're doing, I, I'm very excited about where things are going. And not everyone releases everything. Brown Foreman has, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, experiments going on, but you may not see half of them. You know, they were, uh, Wild Turkey was experimenting with, um, uh, barrel finishes in the in the nineties, you know, and they, they had one release in the in early two thousands. So you have uh, this stuff has always been going on, um, but I think what you'll, I think there's some things that you may want to pay attention to in terms of an experiment. Uh, you you got to, as bourbon drinkers, we got to develop a a dump button at some <laughs> point with all the mm-hmm. shit that comes at us. Um, and even to me, as an extent, like I'm, I'm numb to some of the stuff that comes my way. One of the big ones for me is the first distillery since Prohibition in, in whatever town or state or whatever. To me, I'm so tired of hearing that. <laughs> you know, to me, like if you're the first distillery in Prohibition, you know, since then, and that's the only if that's the only piece of marketing that you have, push it in your local market. Go for it. All you know, but I, that's not going to be anything that excites me. Uh, but one thing that I think you should be on the lookout for that truly um, is an experiment at, at one level, and that's sweet mashing. Uh, sour mashing is the fermentation technique that we've all known. They take back set from the distillation and put it in the new fermentation. Uh, but sweet mashing is when they don't do that. And when you do sweet mashing, you have a higher chance of bacterial infestation. And you have uh, Peerless Distilling, they're sweet mashing. Uh, Garrison Brothers sweet mashing. Uh, you have um, uh, Wilderness Trail. They're sweet mashing. In addition to sour mashing, or no, just no sour just mash. Exclusively. They're exclusively uh, sweet mashing. And to me, and and that's something from the older days. But no one, um, no one on the bigger side wanted. You know, they didn't want to change that part. Uh, and the reason why you know sour mashing became extremely popular and very important is because they didn't have the equipment to keep themselves sanitational. So if you're if you're running a distillery in 1860, you best be sour mashing because you'll have all this bacterial infestation coming in. By sour mashing, you actually prevent a lot of that. Now, I'm not a distiller and I'm not a chemist. I'm just someone that I've studied history and I know, um, I I know I know some of this stuff. And you have um, in that time, sour mash was a stamp of quality, and so sour sour mash just gets on the label. And then you have like five brands by 1940 who are saying that they're original sour mash. So you have all these terms now. Everyone has an expectation of sour mash. Mm-hmm. But in the coming years, you're going to start to see sweet mash. And I think that's actually really, really interesting. Uh, and you will actually be able to taste it. So do you still think there's a market for experimentation then? I mean, are you- Well, for them, that's not experimentation. That's how they're doing things. Um, I think I think the the time for... Catching people's attention um, might be over, but uh, experimentation is absolutely necessary um, to it, for some of these younger, from these newer distillers, because they don't always want to take on their, they don't always want to take on what the uh, the big, the big guys are doing. It's gonna be a flooded market relatively soon, right? I mean, if you mm. get, we give ourselves another three years, six years, whatever it is, until they have a a good age legit bourbon product like there's going to be there's going to be a, a glut there's going to be an abundance um but yeah there's not going to be anything that sets anybody different from somebody else except one's got a different price point well fancier label I, a bottle whatever it is well i think it depends on the experiment if you take a look at one experiment uh that started in the late uh, started in the 90s that was a barrel finish <laughs> You know, look look where things are now with barrel finishes. They're all over the place. It's all about where where things are from a taste perspective. The uh, it's all about it's it's all about taste. And the minute that the, the um, a product loses its taste, it loses it loses its value to to consumers. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I there's another thing. You know, when it comes out of the just the 
when I when I think about this and I think about the craft whiskey movement and everything, what what about pricing, right? Because I see pricing as a as yeah. a very a very thing that's really hard to overcome. When I when I see a craft whiskey today that is um, three years, four years old, and it's a hundred dollar bottle, and then I've got my Four Roses yellow label over here, and that's a that's a twenty five thirty dollar bottle, and it's arguably better to go with the Four Roses just on history, quality, everything that's already there, um, and not only that. So we have that and that huge gap in the the pricing aspect. But let's let's also take um, you know just like I said the the three hundred seventy five milliliter Abraham Bowman mm-hmm. release that's going to be an eighty or ninety dollar release for three seventy five. Um, will it price hikes like all these things that are happening in regards to pricing like it's getting out of whack. And is there a way that consumers can change anything other than just not buying? Well, one of the, I'll give you an anecdote that I had. I was in total wine. I was talking to, uh, I was talking to someone. I just saw their purchase and they were considering two bottles. It was, um, it was an NDP bottle. So a non, uh, distiller producer of source whiskey product. It was 90 bucks and uh, four rows of small batch, which was like $25. Mm-hmm. And they were considering both of them. Uh, the retailer had recommended the Four Roses, and someone else recommended the Four Roses. But they bought the $90 bottle. And I went up to the lady, and I said, why did you pick that $90 bottle? She said, because the other one was cheap. And so here we are. We have this American mindset that more expensive is better. And you're actually seeing people who increase their prices be rewarded to a certain population of of America. And that's a population that believes that you have to pay $110 for a pair of sneakers and they're actually better than the ones that are $60. They could be the same exact sneaker. Mm-hmm. This plays out in every industry. And there's study after study uh, that shows that there's there's a sweet spot, you know. And for bourbon, I think that sweet spot of pricing is uh you know for for attracting a, a majority of this country is between 60 and 90 dollars unfortunately that's more than a lot of us uh, can afford but distillers are seeing those same studies and they're seeing those same things play out and if you're pissed about it say something you know say something about it on uh, social media uh write these guys uh and by the way, thank the ones who are doing it right for you. You know, like to me, Four Roses, you know, they have, they have remained at that price point uh, for consumers. They did that was a strategy of theirs when they first came back on the market. They wanted to be inexpensive and of high quality. So I think you got to thank those people when they are of, of great value. Heaven Hill, Henry McKenna. If Heaven Hill is listening and they take Henry McKenna off, you know, the ten year old. Off. I mean, I said this with Elijah Craig one too, but I mean, it, it'll make me cry. You know, Henry McKenna is where it, is where a lot of it's at for me it, from a from a purchasing perspective. Right. It, that's. I mean, the thing is with these big guys, and maybe it's a it's a thing of you know they've got they've got the stock so they can price it accordingly, right? Where they can go by volume rather than mm-hmm. um, by a certain market share. But at the same time, they've also been in the market forever. They've they've tested it, and, yeah. and so I think they know the price that they're at. And I think, I think the problem is is that we've gotten spoiled, right? We've gotten spoiled of the fact that yeah, sure, somebody now they want to do a, a whatever price hike, uh, and they're gonna be, we're gonna be mad, right? Like if all of a sudden Henry McKenna was a sixty dollar bottle, like people are gonna be mad about it, right? Um, because it's been a solid go to bourbon, um, all these different kinds. Of, I mean, I think the uh, the Booker's. Uh, fiasco is a is a very good, um, I, or kind of a, an idea of, of what the the cr- outcry was just from the bourbon community. Itself. Yeah, I think there's a lot more to the bourbon thing or the Booker's one um, than the outcry because the outcry was significant, but I mean it was just among whiskey, whiskey geeks. Yeah, right? not, not the general yeah. populace. Yeah, I, I think there we had. Uh, I think we whiskey geeks had our insiders at Beam helping us to get it back down to the pricing. I don't think there was anything nefarious going on to uh, push the, you know, push the case sales of that particular brand because I mean that was a very good selling brand. I mean, so there's no problems mm-hmm. there. But it's not like it flew off the shelf, right? You can always like you can go to any store, you can always find Booker's. You, yeah, you can always right? find Booker's, and it does well. Mm-hmm. So it's not a brand that's hurting. 
at least to my knowledge. Um, but I, you know, there's a lot of these things that you you got to realize that these companies are large companies, and they buy people or they they bring in people who are not whiskey related. They come from Procter and Gamble. Um, you know, two weeks ago they were a franchise director for a Sonic Company or whatever. There's just they just buy they just bring in people. Mm-hmm. They and, just know how to run the business. Doesn't really matter the product. Per yeah, se. yeah. The, the distillers, the Jimmy Russells, the Jim Rutledges, the Harlan Wheatleys, those guys, they don't have a say. I mean, they're the face and they're the sexy person there. But the person who makes all the decisions is an MBA from whatever state university who's dictating to the rest of us what we're drinking, the label of it, what you know, what the price is going to be. And in five years, they're going to be fucking selling uh, Toyotas at uh, you know on a regional level or something. I mean, they you have um, this is just another job for a lot of people. But you know, I look at you know, some of the core companies that bring value to uh, to us consumers. They actually try to hire people who have that that same kind of passion and drive. And while the while the Elijah Craig age statement dropping. I mean, it, it was painful for me. Like that was like my that was my go to, mm-hmm. and I'm only just now where I can get back to drinking Elijah Craig. <laughs> um, you boycotted it long enough. You're it just was like, yeah. Oh, I'll come back. Well, around. here's what happened: was uh, uh, I did one of these events at the Kentucky Derby Museum, and they put it out there, and I was like, all right, I'll taste this. And I tasted, it, I was like, fuck, this is good. Damn it! <laughs> and, I, and I tweeted or I said something uh, publicly, and it's like, fine, I'm over it. It was it only took me like eight months, but. But you got to re- realize, man, we have relationships with these brands. I mean, they got us through camping trips, in-laws, you mm-hmm. know, all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, it's uh, we, we're really connected to the brands. Right. You and, have that brand, you have that memory that's tied to it or whatever it is. But, you know, in defense of Heaven Hill, I mean, the value that they put on the shelf is second to none, you know. And I think a lot of it is, is the people that they hire and they bring in, uh, they are bourbon, you know they're not bringing in these fancy MBAs, and if they do, they're from the family or or vetted with, from their family. And mm-hmm. so you have you have uh, value that you have people in those companies that are trying to protect us. You know, as bourbon lovers, it's the same with Four Roses. Uh, Beam Suntory has that in Kentucky and in uh, in Illinois they have it a little bit too. But you know, I I think I look I look for. Um, if you have if you have connections in the in the bourbon world, which it doesn't take much, you know, all you have to do is get on Facebook, friend a couple of us, and then friend those their friends, and before you know it, you're you're having coffee with Al Young on a Tuesday. So you you, you just just send it up the ladder. Mm-hmm. If you if you're really passionate about something, you gotta you gotta scream, you gotta fight for it on social media because the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? That's how it usually works. And in this world, we can trend pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, I'm not saying that you know we should be pursuing you know boycotts or or anything like that. One of one of the things that I quickly got over was the the boycotts of of um, you know of of brands that acquired trademarks and put on a label and and started using those backstories for for their whiskey. I mean, everyone does that. I mean, you, you'd have to boycott the entire bourbon industry, mm-hmm. um, you know, because, oh, by the way, Henry, Heaven Hill didn't own Henry McKenna. Um, or, I mean, those labels. Or have, Rittenhouse. They've, or, they've been, I mean, they've, yeah, yeah they've, just, they've been acquired. They've all been traded. They've, it was a lot through, uh, you know, National Stillers going away. Like, all those labels are just something yeah. that they just went up for a bidding war. And then it's, right now you got a lawsuit going on between, I think it was like, what, what Michter's and like, Bombargers or whatever. Oh, that is. one. Like, yeah, that one settled a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, you had you just yeah. had stuff like that going on too. Yeah, yeah, it's it's that's ongoing, and um, you know, if you if you're out there and you're listening and you and you want to start a, a, a bourbon brand, just don't name it anything after anything from Sazerac, <laughs> and don't use a red dripping wax. And you should but be all right. You should be all right. You know, <laughs> now those are the two. Those are the two things that'll get you. There you go. So, uh, Fred, I think we've drained enough bourbon information out of you today. Yep. So I want to say uh, thank you again for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to sit here and talk to you. And uh, 
if you know anybody, you know, Fred is is by far he's one of the truth setter in bourbon. He tells it like it is. And so make sure you go and you see him at Bourbon Beyond at Forecastle. And you know, if you're looking for a getaway in the middle of February in a Norwegian cruise cruise line, I think uh, I think he can take care of you there as well. So it's gonna be a good time. Yeah, the Bourbon Cruise. So I think. Uh, it, by the way, if somebody wants to actually book the Bourbon Cruise, you know how they go go about that. Uh, yeah, uh, Platinum Travel. Just, okay. Yeah, Google Platinum Travel Bourbon Cruise. There you go. So anybody that wants to go out there and do that, that's the way to happen. Uh, if you do like what you hear, make sure you write us some reviews on iTunes. Uh, sell, tell a friend. Do everything you can to help spread the word. Uh, we definitely appreciate everybody that's listening. Um, you know, if you, uh, you know, as I said earlier, uh, you know, when we started off our last episode, we were starting to look for advertisers. So if you run or own a small business or know somebody that does that it can get in front of a few thousand people uh doesn't have to be small actually big miss is probably better but uh if you want to get in front of a few thousand people every single week talking about bourbon uh you know i buy a lot of things from i I listen to podcasts and uh that's that's where i'm most easily reached in fact my new underwear brand is from uh podcasting see me me underwear it does work it does work so make sure you keep that in mind if you are uh you know that's probably too much for the audience out there (laughs) no no everybody watching the video they're just picturing fred in his underwear (laughs) sorry (laughs) so again fred want to say thank you again i appreciate it and we will see you all next week cheers man (laughs) 